Now we're turning this morning to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. And to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And just take your time and find the place. And we'll be reading some verses together uh, this morning from this uh, wonderful psalm. And let us pray and ask the Lord uh, for His help and that He will speak to us this morning. Father, we bow before Thee today again. And we thank You, Lord, for the hymns that we've been singing. We thank You, Lord, for every individual that has come to this meeting today. And we thank You, Lord, that they are precious in Your sight. And Father, we just cry and ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning that You would come, Lord, and breathe life and freedom and power into this meeting. We pray that You will move, Lord, across the whole spectrum of need here today. And whatever, Lord, is on the hearts of Your people, we pray that they will hear that still, small voice. We pray, Lord, that You would just settle us this morning in the presence of God, that we would be conscious, Lord, of the presence of the Almighty drawing near. And so, Lord, we just ask today that you would come, and Father, that you would brood, Lord, over this house today. We pray this morning, O God, that you would give divine help. We pray for the anointing of God to be upon your word. We ask for that authority, Lord, that will go down into the deep recesses of all of our heart. We pray that there will be a word in season to all of our souls. And so, Lord, I give myself to Thee this morning, praying that Thou will cleanse and fill and sanctify and anoint with the Holy Spirit. We pray that You'll just shut us in, Lord. Remove every distraction. Remove everything from us, Lord. We pray that we will just sit at the feet of our Master today, And Lord, we will hear thy voice. And so we commit, Lord, this meeting into your care in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. This wonderful psalm, Psalm 37, is a psalm of David. And this man of God, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, is now, he's now an old man. And if you cast your eye just to verse 25, he says, I have been young, and now I am old. And here the psalmist David, he's starting to write this wonderful psalm as an old man that has been through many, many difficulties. He's been through many trials. He's been through many storms. And even like Ezekiel in Ezekiel 47, he could say concerning the Lord, He brought me through. And now as an old man, this psalmist David, he takes his pen again and he starts to pen this wonderful 37th psalm. He's penning this psalm from experience. This man is going to write something that he has learned over the years that he has walked and talked with God. He's just like John the Apostle In 1 John, he says, What we have seen and what we have heard declare we unto you. He wasn't talking about another man's experience. He wasn't going to preach about another man's trial. He says, I'm going to speak to you this morning, firsthand. Now, as we launch out in this message today, I want you to use your imagination just for a moment. I want you to imagine this morning that this Psalm 37 is a letter that has been penned not only by David, but under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And I want you to see at the start of this Psalm the words, Dear Believer. And you put your name in there this morning. And as I look over this congregation, I could name many names, but you just put your name in there this morning. There's David Marshall down there. David Marshall can say this morning, this letter is addressed to me. Charlotte could say, this letter is addressed to me. Rhonda and Adrian down at the back, I want you to put your name in there this morning and just forget about Stephen Riddle and to forget about everyone else around you. And this old saint of God, David, 
who is now an old man, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he takes his pen and he addresses it this morning to you as an individual. And there's some wonderful things that he'll write to you and I in this letter. There's three things that stand out, and I just want to leave them before you this morning. He leaves before every one of us daily directions to follow. Look at verse 1. He says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. And now this old saint of God, he's writing to you as an individual this morning, and he's going to give you and I these daily directions. And the first thing that he says for you and I to do every day is, Fret not thyself. He says it again in verse 7. He says it again in verse 8. You see that word fret there? It's a word to be wearied. It's a word to be worried. It's a word to be disturbed. It's a word to be anxious and distressed and to be vexed. Now I wonder this morning as you start to read through this letter that David has penned over 3,000 years ago, and we're addressing it to ourselves as individuals this morning, I wonder, is he starting to hit the note of your life already? Fret not thyself. Don't be annoyed. Don't be disturbed. Don't be anxious. You see that phrase there, because of evildoers? It's not concerning the world that David's talking about here. That word evil doers is an old Hebrew word, and this is what it means. He says, don't fret yourself, don't be anxious, don't worry yourself about those who show themselves to be friendly, but have it in their heart to hurt you, to wound you, and to shame you. And I think as David was penning this letter this morning, I think the tears must have started to come out of his eyes and I think his mind went back to his great friend and indeed his best friend by the name of Ahithophel. He said that Ahithophel was my familiar friend. He said that we took sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of God and there we worshipped. His words were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. And I can tell you, whenever David's best friend turned against him, David came to the place in his life where he almost gave up. And in Psalm 55, he said this, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. And I can tell you that's a wonderful thing for you and I to do every day, is fret not thyself because of evildoers, and there's maybe someone here this morning, and it's not really the wounds of the world that has went deep. It's not really the accusations of those that work with you or even your community, but it's maybe even a believer in this house this morning that used to be a familiar friend. And you maybe went with them to the house of God, but you're not doing that now, and there's a deep wound in your heart. Here's an old man, and he's talking to you this morning. And he says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. That's something that you and I will need to learn to do every day, not just today. But then he goes on, and look at verse 3. One of these other daily directions, he said, trust in the Lord. Put your trust in Him. And I think as David was penning this third verse, I think his mind went back to the days as a young boy. He was out in the hillside of Judea. I think as he minded his father's sheep, and there came a day when there was the roar of the lion, and then the bear came. And this young stripling of a lad was isolated, and he was cornered in by the enemy. And whenever he was telling the story to Saul, he said, the Lord delivered me from the law, the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. And he says to you and I this morning, trust in the Lord. As he went down into the valley of Elah and he went past all of the mighty men of valor, 
all of the mighty men of war in Israel, and he went down with his shepherd's rod and his shepherd's bag, his five stones and his little sling, and he went towards that giant of a man on his own, and I can see him running towards Goliath, and I can hear him under his breath. He said, the battle is not mine, it's the Lord. You can trust in God this morning. You can put your trust in him and even as David thought of Saul and how he was hunted as a partridge across the hills of Israel and Judea, I can tell you here was a man that learned to trust in God. And he could say, blessed are they that put their trust in him. He could say, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's something that you'll need to learn to do, not just today, but every day. You'll need to learn to trust Him. Simply trusting every day, trusting through the stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, Trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall, oh, trusting Jesus, that is all. Now God's talking to some of you this morning. This man, he not only talked about trusting in the Lord, and he not only told us not to fret, look at verse 4, he says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. And I can tell you there's some desires in this room this morning. There's desires that parents have for their children. There's desires that many of us have, and indeed all of us have, to go on with God and hear this old saint, this sweet psalmist of Israel, as he comes, as it were, in the last lap of his life, and he's writing a letter that is addressed to you and me. He says, fret not thyself, Trust in the Lord. And then he says, delight thyself. You see that word delight there? It's the word to be pliable. It's the word to be easily molded. It's the word that the potters used to use when they put the clay upon the wheel and the wheel would turn and he would put his hand into the clay and he would mold it. The clay is easily moved. It's pliable. It's easy to work with. And here's David, this old man of God, and he's saying to you and I this morning, just give it into the hand of the Lord and let him mold you. Let him shape. Give him time on the wheel, and I can tell you, he will make all things beautiful in his own time. These are some things that we're going to have to do every day. Look at verse 5. He said, not only to delight in the Lord, he says, commit thy way unto the Lord. That word is the word to rule over a heavy burden. It's a word when a man is carrying a heavy weight and he comes maybe to the end of a flatbed trailer and he'll put the weight onto the trailer and he'll roll it off his shoulder onto the trailer. And David, this old saint of God, he said, this is how I dealt with my burdens. This is how I dealt with the storms. This is how I dealt with the trials in my own life. He said, I learned to roll them on the Lord. I couldn't carry them on my own. And my dear believer, this morning, God doesn't expect you to carry the burden on your own. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I can tell you the believer's life is filled with burdens, but oh, how sweet it is when we know that God has laid the burden on our heart. And David says, learn to rule. My Catherine and Ruth sometimes sing it, learning to lean, learning to lean. David didn't say I'm leaning. He said I'm rolling. I roll it over to him. I think the Apostle Peter learned that. And he said casting all, it's the same word, rolling all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Now quickly, look at another daily direction in verse 7, and then we'll move on. He said, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
Now, David's writing this letter to you this morning, and he's writing it to me. He says, my dear believer, if you're going to go on and you're going to survive the hills and the valleys, you'll not only need to learn to rule, and you'll not only need to commit, and you'll not only need to learn to delight and trust and fret not yourself, he says you'll need to learn to rest. To rest. You see that word rest there? It's the old Hebrew word to be dumb. Stop talking. Say no more. And maybe there's someone here this morning and you're at the end of your tether and you've been mumbling and grumbling under your breath and you say, oh God, I can't go on any longer and you're, you're complaining and we all get there at times and we, we get into its corner and we get down into the dumps. Well, here's something that David learned to do. He said in the midst of it all, there was times and many times when I just had to say nothing. Just be dumb. Way back in Exodus chapter 15, that same word is translated like this. Be as still as a stone. And a stone doesn't move and a stone doesn't speak. And I can tell you there's times as believers whenever the enemy comes and the accusations of the devil come and so often we get into debates with the devil. I can tell you there's times in our life when we just need to be silent and let the Lord do the talking. Roll it all over to him. I tell you, whenever David went back to Ziglag and the enemy had come and taken the family and taken all of the soldiers' goods, the Bible says that David encouraged himself and the Lord. He was silent. And there's many of us, we need to learn again how to be quiet. To be still and know that I am God. It's the word there that is used whenever someone is playing like Shar on the organ and then they come to a moment and they take their hands off the keys. It's the word not only to be still, but take your hand off it. And maybe there's a situation in your life this morning and you want to lay your hand on it. Just be still. Just rest. Just wait on the Lord. There's not only in this letter some daily directions in this letter that David has penned to us this morning. There's some delightful declarations. Look at verse 23. He said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And maybe you've fallen during the week. That word fallen there is a word to be pushed down. And I know there's one believer here this morning that wouldn't tell you and they haven't told me yet, but I know the enemy has been pushing you down, dear, during the week. I know the enemy has been putting his hand on your shoulder. The word is not only to push down, the word is to pull down. It also is translated the word to trip. And there's times, you know, whenever the enemy gets his tentacles around us with accusations in the mind and with family members and the devil comes against us like a roaring lion and he wants to push us down and hold us down and if he can't do that, he'll stick his dirty foot out to trip you down. But this is what David learned. He learned over the years. He said, though he fall, though he trip." Lo, he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You see that word upholdeth there? It's the word to brace, it's the word to support. Look at verse 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, adversity, distress. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. Now I haven't got time to go on with that this morning, but these are some delightful declarations that David has proved through his life that you and I can learn this morning that God will protect us, God will help us, God will hold us up with His right hand. Hallelujah. But that's not what I'm after this morning. That's not what God really has to say to us today. 
It's not these delightful declarations, and it's not even these daily directions that I'm after today. I'm after one word that's mentioned three times in this psalm. In Psalm 37, you'll get it in verse 7, you'll get it in verse 9, you'll get it in verse 34. You know that the word from God is to your soul today. Wait. Wait. Spurgeon said it's the easiest of all words to say and the hardest of them all to do, to wait. We live in a generation where we want everything now. Fast cars, fast broadband, fast food, fast sermons. And then whenever you run out of fast, to put on super fast. And I can tell you there's times in all of our lives we lift our heart to heaven and we would say, God, would you not do it now? Would you not, Lord, just break into this situation now? And at times, I know I am, like in Petrus Peter, my, there was that day when he stepped out of the boat. There was a day when he spoke out with his lips. There was a day when he lashed out with his sword. Peter was impatient. He always wanted to take things into his own hand. And I say again, maybe that's exactly where you are today. Some situation, and maybe even after this meeting, you're going to do something or intend to do something out of impatience, and you'll make a mess of it. And David said that he learned to wait. I know we, talk, we read in the Bible about the word suddenly. I love that word. The God whom ye seek shall suddenly come. My, in the day of Pentecost, they were gathered there in the upper room, and the Bible says, suddenly, there is a sound from heaven. My, as Paul went along the Damascus road, breathing out threatenings and slaughter, the Bible says, suddenly, there is a light above the strength of the noonday sun. But there's times in all of our lives when God just doesn't seem to move as quick as what we would like. And we need to learn to wait. We need to learn. I can tell you what David went on to say in Psalm 40 and verse 1. He said, I waited patiently upon the Lord. And what that really means in the original is this, I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited again. Waiting upon God. And I want to close this meeting this morning by giving you some illustrations of when God delays. Oh, I know there's many times when he breaks through suddenly, and thank God for that. Thank God there's times when the answers come immediately. Before we even rise from our knees, God has broken through. But then there's times that David had to wait. There's times when God delays. And we need to find out what they are and why they are. I want you to come with me in your mind this morning. I'm not going to get you to turn to too many passages. I just want you to use your imagination this morning as you start to read through this letter that David, 3,000 years ago, was penned to you and me. And I want you to come away back almost 6,000 years. And I want you to come into a little home. It's a, there's a man there by the name of Enoch. And it says that Enoch was 65 years of age. And Enoch begot Methuselah. And Enoch for 65 years, he didn't think about God. He didn't walk with God. He did what he wanted. He went where he wanted. He just lived my fast and loose. But there came a day in his life when there was a little baby boy was born into his family. And God must have come into the maternity ward that day. Because God named him, when he shall die, judgment will come. And I think because of that, Enoch started to think about God. I'm sure of that, that Enoch that day got right with God because he said, this boy may not, may not even live an hour. He may not live a day. He may not even live a year. And I would need to get right with God. And for 969 years, God delayed his judgment. 960 years, Peter says in his epistle, that the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. 
And Methuselah was the grandfather of Noah. And I think that every time Enoch heard Methuselah cough, I, I think he said, is judgment coming today? Every time he got a little stomach bug as a little boy, and every time he didn't feel too well, I wondered, did Enoch say, is he going to die? Is judgment going to come today? And God delayed his judgment in this old world for 969 years. The oldest man that ever lived. And I can tell you there's times when God delays to display his mercy. He delays to display his mercy. I tell you, the, the, the prophet Jeremiah said, it is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. I tell you, you think back to whenever you weren't saved. Think of the things that you and I have done. And God could have come suddenly and wiped us off the face of this whole world and yet in mercy he delayed his judgment again and again and again. And if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I can tell you it's only the mercy of God that you're sitting on the very seat that you're on. He's delayed his mercy for you. But the long suffering of God ran out because there came a day when Methuselah died and judgment came. And you know, not only for the unsaved this morning, but for the believer, I can tell you, you and I can live in secret sin, and we can think that we've got away with it. And because God hasn't acted in judgment, we think that He has overlooked it, or He has forgotten about it. But He's delaying His judgment and mercy, dear believer. What about David? Whenever David took Bathsheba, I was preaching on it the other night, and he lay with Bathsheba. He looked at her. He lusted after her. He lay with her. He lied about her. And for 13 months, the psalmist David, this very man, he covered it all over. And there came a day whenever God sent Nathan. And I think as he opened the door of the palace, I think he hit it with a bang. And David jumped. And Nathan walked into the king of Israel on the throne, and he says, you're the man that God's after. God had found him out. There's times when God delays in mercy. He doesn't always do that, you know. He didn't do it with Uzziah. Whenever Uzziah went into the temple, my, immediately, God smote him with leprosy on the head. He didn't do it with Uzzah. Whenever Uzzah put his hand in the cart, suddenly God struck him down. He didn't do it with Ananias and Sapphira. Whenever they lied about their money, I can tell you, they died suddenly and the judgment of God came. And maybe you're a believer here this morning and you're fiddling in secret sin and you forgot about it and you think that God has forgotten about it, but he's just delaying his judgment and mercy. Ezra said he has given us a little time to escape. And your time this morning could run out. I tell you, God's talking. God's talking. But not only does God delay His judgment at times to display His mercy, I want you to come with me now and I want you to fast forward through the book of Genesis and we're going to, we're going to stand at the door of a tent. And there's an old man and he's lying down. He's not sleeping, but he's just lying down. He's well on over a hundred years of age. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 22 that after all these things, God tempted or tested Abraham. And there's times when God delays not only to display his mercy, there's times when God delays to test his people. Because I can tell you every test that Abraham went through up until Genesis 22, he failed. He failed every one of them. He went down into Egypt. He lay with Hagar and on and on you could go. And after all of these things, God came to test him again. And maybe that's where you are this morning. You're in the crucible of testing. And God has put you into an exam to see what you're going to do. And as Abraham lay, my in his tent, he heard a voice. And Abraham learned to listen to that voice, and God spoke to him, and he said, Abraham, here am I, Lord. He said, take thy son, 
Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go into the land of Moriah, and there offer him as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will show unto thee. Abraham didn't remonstrate. Abraham just kept silent. And the Bible says that he rose early in the morning. He saddled his ass and he cleaved the wood. And he got his two servants and his son and made his journey three days into the land of Moriah. And then the Bible says that he saw the place afar off. And he told the two servants, he said, Stay ye here. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And as they made their way up the side of Mount Moriah, Isaac, my, the son that Abraham loved with all of his heart, Isaac turned to his father. And he said, Dad, we've got the fire and we've got the wood, but where is the lamb? I can tell you that question went through the heart of Abraham like no question that he had ever heard before. And he said, Son, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. And now they tramped up the side of the hill of Moriah, and they came to the top of Moriah. But God hadn't given the lamb yet. There was no sign of a lamb. And then what Abraham did, he built the altar and he got the stones. And I think he dragged it out. I would if I was him. And he set the stones in order and he got the wood upon the order. But the lamb wasn't there yet. No lamb. And then he looked at his son Isaac and he, the Bible says, bound him. But the lamb wasn't there yet. This was the darling of his bosom now. This was the love of his heart. And God told him to sacrifice it. And I think Abraham maybe thought that God was going to intervene before they ever got to the top of the mountain. But still there was no lamb there. And the Bible says that Abraham bound his son and laid him on the wood. I can tell you there was tears coming out of his eyes. I say to you again, I think he dragged it out as long as he could. God hasn't come yet. Where's God in all this? But God was delaying. And not only did he bind him and lay him on the altar, the Bible says that he, he took his hand and he got the knife. And he got the knife, but the lamb wasn't there. And he was about to plunge it into his son, the darling of his bosom. And I can tell you, just as Abraham was about to thrust the knife into the son, God broke through. He brought him to the very wire. Brought him to the very wire. And he says, Abraham, lay not thy hand upon the lad, for now I know. Abraham had learned to wait. He had learned to wait. Now I know that thou dost fear God. And maybe I say again, my dear believer, God has brought you into a corner. And you've been praying and you said, Oh God, I thought you would have come by now. I thought you would have turned the tide by now, Lord. I thought, Lord, you'd have intervened, but you haven't come. That's exactly the way Abraham was on the hill of Moriah. God, I say again, brought him to the wire. And then there was the ram. God was just on time. And my dear believer, whoever it is you're praying for, and whatever it is you're praying for, God hasn't forgotten about you. No, he hasn't. He's just testing you now. Just testing. And here was David. He said, you'll need to learn to wait. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Don't move. Don't move now. I tell you, Joseph had to learn to wait. He had the dreams as a young boy. He went into the prison. He was there for years, but then there came a day when God brought him to the wire, and the Bible says that the word of the Lord tried or tested Joseph. It was there where Saul failed. I haven't got time to go into that this morning. 
But Saul, the first king of Israel, the reason why he lost the anointing, the reason why he lost his ministry, the reason why he lost his position was because he was to wait for Samuel seven days when the Philistines came to Gilgal. And the Bible says that Saul waited, but Samuel came not. And he went and he did what he shouldn't have done. He he offered a sacrifice to God. And just as the smoke was ascending, Samuel came over the brow of the hill and he said, what is this thing that thou hast done? He just should have waited another half an hour. And he lost it all because of impatience. There's not only times when God delays to display His mercy, and there's times when God delays to test His people. There's times when God delays to exhibit His power. I want you to come with me now as we come to a close, and we're, we're going to go into a very sad house. There's tears here. A little house down in Bethany, And the two sisters, Mary and Martha, they they sent word to the Lord Jesus, and he was only in Jerusalem. He was only a day's journey away. And they said, Lord, you better come. He whom thou lovest is sick. And in John 11, you read it today, the Bible says, when Jesus heard these things, he abode there still two more days. Two days. And then on the fourth day he came my to Bethany. And as he turned the corner around the Mount of Olives and he, he came towards the little hamlet, the house of poverty, I think he could hear the cries. And as he came down into Bethany, my Martha ran towards him and she ran to the feet of the master and says, Lord, if you had have been here, if you would have come whenever I told you to come, my brother wouldn't have died. And the Lord Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And she said, yea, Lord, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And the Lord Jesus with piercing eyes turned into the heart of Martha, says, Martha, but I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha ran away and got Mary. And Mary came again and she said, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. And I can tell you, oh, my dear people, it seemed to be that he was late, but he was just on time. My, he had been in the grave for four days. He was stinking. Decomposition had set in. And Jesus, as he went to the grave, he wept. And he said, roll away the stone. And with all of the divine power of all omnipotence of the Creator that endued the Son of God, all the fullness of God, he stood at the graveside in Bethany and he said, Lazarus, come forth. I think all of the crying stopped. I think if you broke a twig that day, you would have heard it. And my, just from the inside of the cave, there came a noise. And Lazarus walked forward bound foot and mouth and a napkin over his head. And the Lord said, loose him and let him go. And you know what the Bible says? Many of the Jews believed on him. Oh, they had seen many sick people given given their health back again. But whenever they saw the power exhibited like this, you know what happened? Many of them believed. And maybe God is just bringing you, my dear mother, to the wire And you've been praying, Lord, you need to come now. My boy's at Whitsand Corner. My boy's near going into a lost eternity. Lord, would you just come now? And God's delaying because he wants to exhibit his power in a different way than what you think. He delays, I can tell you, to exhibit his power. Now, we're closing now. He delays to test his people. He delays to display his mercy. There's times when he delays, my dear believer, and you'll need need to learn this. And so do I. To fulfill his will. The time's just not right. I tell you, whenever God looked down at this old sin-cursed world, my with men and women and living in sin and debauchery, sin all around them, I tell you, he knew that they needed a saviour But for 4,000 years, God waited. 
And the Bible says when the fullness of time was come, it means when the right time was come, God sent forth his son. And maybe that's just where you are again. You're waiting and you're praying and you're fighting and you're battling and you say, oh God, where are you in all of this? And God, I can tell you, wants to fulfill his will and you and I will learn to wait. If the Lord Jesus had come a thousand years before he did, the cross wasn't even invented. He had to die on a cross. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Here's something for you to think about. Delay is not the same thing as denial. Not yet is not the same as no. David said, I learned to wait patiently upon the Lord. And I can tell you he broke through. You know, Amy Carmichael, that wonderful woman of God that lived down in Malayal, she was a woman that was mightily used of the Lord. And one day she was lying on her bed and she had rheumatoid arthritis. She had to lie with eight pillows at night. She couldn't sleep. She used to be active for the Lord, but her body wouldn't allow her now to do what she used to do. And maybe some of you old believers this morning, that's just how you feel. And there was a night when every Amy Carmichael came to the end of the road and she said, Lord, would you not come and take the church home tonight? I'm tired of the battle. I'm tired of the taunts of the enemy, Lord. I'm tired of sickness. I'm tired of weariness. Lord, would you not come home? Take me home tonight. Would you not come back for the church? And you know, Amy Carmichael got a vision that night. And just you be careful what you say about vision. She got a vision that night and the Lord Jesus said to Amy Carmichael, she said, my dear, I would come back tonight, but my people are not ready. And there's times when God delays to display his mercy. There's times when God delays to test his people. There's times when God delays to exhibit his power. There's times when God delays to fulfill his will. There's times that God delays to prepare his bride because if the Lord Jesus came now, I can tell you there'd be many of us here, we'd be ashamed. We would be ashamed. We would be ashamed in our prayer life. We would be ashamed in our personal holiness. We would be ashamed in how we occupy our days. We would be ashamed in our lack of love for the lost and our lack of zeal for the church. We would be, we would be ashamed, I can tell you, for our lack of purity, our lack of being sincere. I can tell you, and I would believe that the Lord Jesus has delayed His coming just to get His bride right. And here's a wee word to you this morning. I'm going to sit down. There's some of you here, and if the Lord Jesus came now, and you haven't got that relationship sorted out with another believer, you know what would happen? You'd be ashamed. You would now. You would. And there's some of you here, and maybe even myself, my, if the Lord Jesus came now at five past twelve on this Sunday afternoon, I can tell you that some of us will be ashamed about restitution that we never made and we knew we should have made. You haven't made it yet, sir. Maybe about repentance in our life. And I can tell you, I think the Lord Jesus is delayed. Because he wants to prepare the bride. The ten virgins, I can tell you, it says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Is that why he's tarrying? I don't know what God has said to you this morning, my dear believer. But here's a word from a man that's dead 3,000 years ago. Wait! <laughs> Wait, I say, upon the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. We're going to stand to sing this morning, and our dear sister is going to come, and I want us to stand to your feet, and we're going to sing it. My times are in thy hands. My God, I leave them there.
And I don't know if we can help you this morning. I'll be in the little room to the back, and if we can help you in any way, my dear people, we're here as your servants. And if you want a word of prayer, if you want us to sit down with the Word of God, if you're in a trial this morning and you can't share it with other people, come and share it with us, and we'll lift you before the Lord in prayer. But let us stand to our feet and sing this wonderful hymn, and then our meeting is over, and we'll gather around the table of the Lord this morning and worship Him.